ready to go when you are, Mr. Chair. 10-4, Kerry, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is City Council Lodge Michael Flaherty. I'm the Vice Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. It is Thursday, December 2nd, 2021, and we are here today for a virtual working session on docket 0638. That's an ordinance to create the Boston Commemoration Commission sponsored by City Councilor Kenzie Bach and referred to the committee on May 5th, 2021. This working session is being hosted virtually via Zoom and being recorded in accordance with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 modifies certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieves public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct its meetings in a public place that is open and physically accessible to the public. This enables the City Council to carry out its responsibilities while adhering to public health accommodations and ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate and alternative means. The public may watch this working session via live stream at www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, Verizon 964. It will also be rebroadcasted at a later date. Docket 0638 is an ordinance that would establish a Boston Commemoration Commission with the purpose of developing a plan to celebrate upcoming historical anniversaries of significance to Boston and to ensure that the celebration of such historical events are inclusive, historically accurate, and celebrates the diverse history of our city. The proposal establishes the uh, membership of the commission, authorizes the creation of subcommittees, and defines the responsibilities and authority of the commission. The committee held a public hearing back um, on October 19th, 2021. At the hearing, the committee heard from the administration officials about the archaeology programs in the city, historic preservation, and the role of the city archives in the planning. Testimony was also heard from members of the public in support of the proposal, highlighting the importance of inclusivity and equity in historic preservation, tourism, as well as suggestions to include Boston National Historical Parks, engage the business side of the heritage, heritage tourism, and include the Massachusetts Tribe and Timelines, Exhibits, and Curricula Subcommittee. Joining us today, I'm assuming we're still, uh, and I'm following the uh, sheet that I have in front of me, um, but I believe um, joining us uh, is Roseanne Foley, Executive Director of the Boston Landmarks Commission, David Leonard, President of the Boston Public Library, Kate Davis, Director of Office of Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment, and Kara Elliott Ortega, Chief of Arts and Culture, and also joining us today is Lemche Frazier and Leon Wilson from the Museum of African American History, Allison Frazier from Boston Preservation Alliance. Uh, and before I turn it over to the lead sponsor, Councilor Bach, for opening remarks, and then to uh, my colleagues in their order of arrival, uh, all councilors uh, should have received a red line version of the ordinance prior to the start of the session, uh, and that uh, was coming via central staff because we will be working. Um, line by line uh, from this document at the uh, at the lead, uh, following the lead of, uh, of lead sponsor, Councilor Bach. So with that, I want to turn it over to Councilor Bach for opening comments, and uh, we'll go from there. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Great. Thank you so much, Councilor Flaherty, um, for your leadership here, and uh, to all the um, chiefs and folks uh, joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, and I know that many of the people watching today have been kind of along this journey with us. Um, I think that, but I want to recap it nonetheless. Um, you know, Boston often gets talked about as a historic city, and I think our history is really important to us. Um, and I think that what's equally important to us is that when we talk about Boston's history, history, we really be talking about the whole history, right? That like all of our neighborhoods have history, that indigenous people in the city have tremendous history, black um, Bostonians going all the way back to before the revolution. Um, that you know our more recent immigrant histories are really important to hold up and uh and often you know the types of history that get preserved in amber in people's minds um they come out of major events and commemorations um and the curricula that, that kids learn in schools and so um the initial impetus for this a uh, commission was really recognizing that uh the city of boston is coming up on two major historical anniversaries um, which which will be marked um, nationally, the 250th anniversary um, of the country's founding in 2026, um, and then here in Boston, the 400th anniversary for Boston in um, 2030. 
Uh, and, and one of the things that we found ourselves discussing with folks was, you know, we want those to be kind of pivot points and, and goal dates that help us think about how to really revitalize the city's whole history and all of our resources um, for supporting it. So some of the types of things that we're thinking about are for sure, the economic development aspects of really supporting historical tourism um, and recognizing that that's something that in the bicentennial, uh, Philadelphia managed to do much better than we did. Um, and when we're talking about tourism businesses around the city uh, that have really been hit extremely hard by the COVID crisis, like focusing on that is important from a dollars and cents perspective. And it's important in terms of really getting it into the neighborhoods. I mean, Boston has had a national success with marketing the Freedom Trail, but we should have heritage trails in all of our neighborhoods that are drawing traffic and are supporting locally owned um, tourism businesses. So there's an economic aspect here. Um, there's also a huge need to update our historic preservation tools. Uh, so Boston, um, really, you know, the landmark commission here, when we first founded it, um, we were really uh, setting the mark nationwide um, for historic preservation. And it was around the time of the bicentennial 50 years ago. Um, now that we're coming up on this 250th, it's a good time um, to really to really make sure that the, the tools we have to preserve Boston's historic buildings um, and historic sites like the, um, the Native American quarry that the Landmark Act uh, Commission took some initial action on last week are you know protected and that we can uh, we can you know do everything that we need for adaptive reuse that we can preserve our local landmarks um, and that we can think about a new process for demolition delay um, that really serves all people better. And so we thought that you know using these dates as a as another way to sort of set goals around doing that work is important. Um, we also think that we need to have a much more thorough understanding and survey of the city's historic resources. So it's historic built resources. Um, there's a real equity issue around the fact that uh, it tends to be that the already celebrated historic resources that have funding and groups attached to them are the ones that are able to apply for more funding and support. Um, and again, when we think about historic preservation stretching into our neighborhoods, uh, we we need to sort of start from a place of how do we survey the whole city historically in order to really bring equity into that work um, and make sure the same resources are available um, in low-income communities around the city. Uh, and, and I think again and again, as we've been doing this work, it's come up how school children's you know, mindset was shaped by what they learned in the bicentennial. And so we really don't wanna miss these opportunities to have um, young Bostonians look around and see themselves mirrored in the history that they hear at the 250th and the 400th. And then I think really importantly as well, well, we started from those dates in the process of this conversation. And um, one of the things that was underscored was that we have to be looking at our timelines and asking what are the important dates for our different communities in the city? What are important dates for indigenous Bostonians? Um, how do we kind of even in, in terms of the dates that we mark reclaim uh, a, a more inclusive story? Uh, and so bringing on board folks who think about all those different areas of history, bringing on board archivists to talk about the community resources that are often moldering in a basement somewhere um, that tell really important stories for us. Uh, these are all critical pieces. And if this sounds sprawling, it's because it is. Um, and if you think, as we discussed today, the working session, uh, the list of folks we're thinking of having on this commission, it seems kind of long, it is. Um, but I think one of the things that we learned along the way over the course of the year is that Boston has a lot of different corners of our city government that are trying to do some of this historical work, um, but they're very diffuse and not necessarily talking to each other. And so the opportunity to use a commission like this to really pull a lot of those threads together um, and move with a sense of purpose and urgency um, around really, uh, really owning that kind of America's historical city in a full and new and inclusive sense um, that's what we want to what we want to grab hold of here. Um, so I'm really grateful to the many folks I know we'll hear from today. And I know that uh, figuring out the nuts and bolts of a commission um, is always uh, a little bit complicated and creaky. And I'm grateful to the administration folks and uh, many of the groups that sent us feedback and comments ahead of this. Um, so our purpose today, um, after obviously any other counselor opening statements and hearing from the admin, um, is to run through some of the changes that we've made so far to the document and the consultation with the um, mayor's legal staff that's gone into that. 
and then um, you know see if there's anything else that comes up today that we need to take a look at before bringing this before the council for potential passage um, prior to the end of the legislative session. So uh, that was uh, I didn't have my notes, so hopefully I covered all the bases. Um, but uh, Mr. Chairman, that's a, just a quick overview of kind of where I'm hoping that we're going today. Thank you, Council Buck, and obviously we're waiving openings, um, but want to make sure we uh, we just dive right into the flow. So. Uh, I'll turn that portion over to you if you don't mind, and, and we can go red line by red line. If there's anything we need from the administration from the get go, but uh, we understand the issue obviously from our last hearing and just want to kind of get to the meat and potatoes if that uh, works for you. Yeah, that's perfect. And I think that makes sense. I think I know that a bunch of things we heard from the administration before we tried to reflect in this red line. So I think probably if we run through the red line and then um, if I, um, you know, Roseanne and Cara and David, just seeing who else, and John and Michael. Yeah, so Kate, Lynn, thank you all for being here, first of all. Um, I think if, if everybody can just kind of make notes along the way about what things we've taken care of and then what issues we haven't, then maybe we can get to the issues that we feel like we haven't taken care of yet at the end part. Um, I just need Carrie to promote Emily Brown, my policy director, so that she can run the slides. Carrie, is that possible? Excellent. Okay, I think Emily is in. So, oh, and um, and uh, Carrie, I think that uh, Reverend Wayne Hammond may also be in the waiting room. Um, okay, uh, Emily, do you mind scrolling right up to the top, just so people, just so people can see. Um, all right, so this is the original ordinance filing. Obviously, there's a preamble that sort of explains uh, where we're coming and talks a little bit about some of the great work that's been done. There's been some really good examples of um, diverse, inclusive, telling the full history events put on by Revolutionary Spaces for the 250th of the Boston Massacre um, that are, are really good kind of marker and example for us um, and talks about some of the important um, the important history uh, and the need, and you know, the economic needs, but all the things that I talked about, um, and uh, the updates to our laws and tools that we need. Um, and I guess one thing I didn't talk enough about in my opening comments was just we really want to use the BPL's resources. We really want to use the city archives resources. We want to think about all that stuff that we keep in basements somewhere. How do we get that out to Bostonians and really vivify the uh, city for folks um, through this process? Uh, Emily, if you keep scrolling. Um, and so that sort of gives the whole explanation of where we're coming from here. And then um, from here, we'll just scroll down and we'll stop it wherever we've got changes. Um, and as it says there, the changes in red were made um, with input from the administration to be consistent with Section 35 of the city charter, which um, lays out some parameters for how commissions need to be framed. Um, and then there's a few other legal concerns. Uh, I should say that uh, we were... We were previously snagging some more authority for the city council here with the appointments, but you know, pescally, our charter is quite clear on commissions. They need to be mayoral appointed um, without council approval. Uh, this is different from um, you know some other uh, types of things like the CPA board, et cetera, that we're creating by ordinance. Um, but because this is a commission, it's kind of specifically covered under that uh, section 35 of the charter. Um, so that's why we that's why we nixed our approval there. Um, and then uh, sort of we're thinking about the whole realm of people who needed to be added onto this. And, and I wanna say before I start going through these that there are a lot of people here. Um, our vision for this is very much one of having a series of subcommittees that are able to say, bite off and chew, how do we support a citywide historical survey? Or how do we do a timeline that really highlights the key dates for our different communities or let's talk about the series of events um, leading up to 2026 uh, and kind of have subcommittees that are the right subselection of these folks deal with that and then come back and report to the whole but that the fact that there is that hub and spoke system keeps everybody informed about each other's work and allows for a real synergy in the work um, so although there's a lot of people on this we are not imagining lots of um, all commissioner meetings happening constantly um, but we did talk about the need to really represent the business community here. Uh, so, and and to think about, we already had the idea of a tourism-related Boston business, both in downtown, 
um, and outside of downtown so that we are thinking about getting stuff into our neighborhoods, um, but also the many historical resources we've got downtown and the tourism um, related businesses hub there. And then one of the feedback points we got was to also think about the broader business community. I mean, things like the tercentenary we, we celebrated 100 years ago, that was an all Boston event, right? And the same thing with um, the 250th. And so we don't just want to be in the tur tourism sector, we want business leadership involved in this um, the whole way through. So that caused us to add um, and philanthropic leaderships that caused the additions of the Chamber of Commerce, TBF and Mass Competitive Partnership seats. Um, and then with, yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, and then on, on number six, we had said two members from a community archive. Um, we learned that that term means a very particular thing and we didn't want to exclude anybody. So we rephrased it slightly two members from a, who are archivists and are seeking to preserve a diverse history, just because that will both allow for archives that include like oral histories and stuff, um, and also some that might be uh, uh, very much the spirit of diverse history, but not technically officially a community archive. Um, and then a member who's a digital archivist or preservation specialist, um, because we've learned that that's really a different skill set um, and so important to thinking about how to how to get some of these um, documentary treasures out uh, out to the broader public. Um, then we have a series that didn't change. Um, we clarified that we definitely want the Native American Indian Center of Boston just to have a seat. And so we didn't, we didn't, um, we nixed that second half of line 11, but we then put a member with expertise in local indigenous history down at 15 so that, um, so that we also have a spot for somebody who's not affiliated. Um, we added a member from the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapoag, and I just want to thank them for joining us at our last hearing. Um, it was really wonderful to hear from them. And, and I think uh, the Massachusetts tribe lately has been involved in some really good consciousness raising about the indigenous history of Boston. I was president of flag raising at the Harbor Club of Boston downtown. Um, and uh, like I said, there's um, some pretty exciting work around preserving this quarry and a lot more to do. Um, one member from the Museum of African American History. Again, we wanted to clarify that we really wanted that specific um, community historical resource to be represented. Um, and then a series of folks who have expertise in the local history of a bunch of different um, communities. So AAPI, Indigenous, Black, European Immigrant, Latinx, Women's, um, LGBT history, uh, LGBTQ history. And then uh, a member with expertise in local intellectual history, um, which as everyone knows is a very rich seam here in Boston and also uh, something that I am, um, is close to my heart. Um, and then we want two members added here from the National Parks of Boston, representing both the Boston National Historic Park and the Boston African American National Historic Site. Um, we think these are really important custodians of our city's history and they already think about how to do sort of popular um, programming, and it would be it would be strange not to have them at this table. So we had omitted them before. Uh, then these others are all folks who are already on with on it. MHS, which is also staffing um, the Rev 250 State Commission, um, a member from the Boston Preservation Alliance, which does a lot of work on those tools I talked about. Revolutionary Spaces, which, as I said, has really been a model for us. Um, the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau, again with the tourism angle. We want a hospitality worker on this, um, somebody who's really seeing the economic impact um, of, of this kind of um, work and really bulking this up in Boston. Um, and someone from the State House, one of our, our elected colleagues there, um, again, to help kind of anchor the state component. And then we thought about, you know, what I kind of mentioned before, the many headed hydra of folks who have a piece of historical work in the city. Um, so it's the, the chief or their designee um, for economic development, for arts and culture, um, the director of the mayor's office of tourism, sports and entertainment. Um, we ended up saying the superintendent. Oh, sorry, I skipped an edit. We, we nixed the ex officio because, again, apparently by charter, that's not how we're supposed to designate it, these people themselves do need to be named, um, even though they're going to hold it by virtue of having the title. Um, on 32, the we switched from the chief academic officer of BPS to the superintendent, simply because uh, the titles in BPS and such can change around. We know we've always got a superintendent, and obviously it's their designee, so they're free to designate somebody who's whoever feels like the most appropriate person. I, I do really want to stress that I think the curricular opportunities to kind of do local trails in our neighborhoods and local exhibits at our BPL libraries that are tying into like great local history. Um, 
uh, units for our kids that are hubbed around the timeline. Like that's part of how you get young people excited about history. And when you get young people excited about history, um, they see themselves in it. They read more. There's just like, there's a ton, um, you know, it's one of the best disciplines to develop like research and, and, and analysis skills. So I think we really want to stress the importance of having BPS uh, in this mix. Um, then we have, as we would before, wait, I'm going to go back up. I just want to, even though we didn't change them, just let people see the archivist, the city archivist, um, city archives are another, uh, two unknown jewel that we have, um, the BPL, uh, our chief environment, energy and open space, which is where the landmarks commission and historic preservation work sits in the city. Um, the ED of the landmarks commission, the chair of it, uh, the director of the BPDA, um, or their designee, uh, again, um, really important uh, from a planning, surveying, et cetera, perspective. Um, our collector treasurer, who's the steward of the one um, concrete financial source for historic preservation in the city, the Community Preservation Trust Fund, which Councillor Flaherty is the lead council chair on, um, and then a Boston City Councillor. Uh, and again, because it's a commission, this person needs to be uh, designated by, um, by the mayor, um, so presumably, you know, hopefully in, in friendly consultation, but uh, that's why we nixed that sentence. And then um, we decided there's a lot of red here because basically we we're being a little overly prescriptive about exactly who was gonna sit on each of the different subcommittees. And we decided that that probably didn't make sense at the legislative level. So we just nixed that um, altogether. I think people will sort themselves into the appropriate subcommittees um, is the hope. And then Emily, can you keep scrolling? Uh, yeah, so right after it says that everyone's gonna serve without compensation, um, the chair for the commission itself and for each subcommittee will be designated by the mayor. Um, again, this is this commission uh, will, will not be taking votes as it were. So that's, we took that out of there. Um, and it's designed to last until uh, the end of the fiscal year that the second half of 2030 is in. Um, so 2030, you know, ends December 31st and then, but that fiscal year continues. So the idea would be that the commission sort of runs until the end of that fiscal year. Um, and then that it, it starts up once we pass this. Uh, and then here in this language, um, again, just following the guidance of the law department, um, rather than implying that the commission has policy making like power, uh, we did soften it to say that the commission is advising the mayor. Um, that's what our other commissions do. Um, we fully intend this to be a working commission. That's why so many people who actually know things are on it. Um, and so the goal is definitely to do lots of, uh, uh, to do lots of um, like, you know, very substantive, important work, but fundamentally it's the mayor who's then receiving those reports um, and who the commission is advising. Um, and so we just specified that, did a little bit of fixing of verbs. Um, we added a specific thing and, and thanks to Kate Davis, who on behalf of the city does a lot of this right now, um, we, we stress the fact that collaborating with state level and regional commemoration efforts is gonna be important. We're obviously the capital city of the state and, uh, and there's, we hope gonna be a lot of coordinated activity and the funneling of federal funds, frankly, um, for that activity, especially around the 250th. So we wanna make sure we're all coordinating. Um, and then determining whether any other subcommittee should be added um, which again, we would advise the mayor on if we were gonna create a new subcommittee, but we didn't wanna lock ourselves in too badly. Um, and then this kind of describes as before, is it's three, sorry, Emily, can you scroll down for a second? Just so I can see, it's a little further. Yeah, okay, so we've got, so just now go back up. Um, so basically there's three major subcommittees being proposed. One of them is about events and trails. Um, one of them is about, and, and again, we just changed it to recommending, one is about timelines, exhibits, and curricula, um, and really needs our kind of um, historical experts. And we added some specific language about digital archives and also about making exhibits and collections accessible and inclusive, which I know is something that, um, that like the BPL has worked a lot on with their collections. Um, 
And then we nixed the sentence about and may invite such guests as the membership deems appropriate since under open meeting law, the commission meetings are gonna be public anyways. So we don't need to specify that guests can be invited. And then, um, is there anything else? No. No, that's it. Okay, so that, I hope I didn't go too fast, but that is a, um, a summary of the changes that we made so far. I want to thank the law department for looking this through and providing all these technical changes and just say that, you know, we were happy to accept those. Um, not, you know, looking for this very much to be a collaborative thing here, um, including at the end. So, um, yeah, so I think, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that summary um, being done by me would love to hear uh, administration feedback on, you know, further things that we didn't address that they think might make sense to address um, before. That'd be great. That works. That sounds perfect. And just, uh, I guess, from the administration standpoint, whoever wants to take the lead, is that David? Uh, uh, you, whoever, whoever on your team wants to go, uh, you guys can take the floor. Um, thank and, you, Mr. And Chairman. Emily, uh, uh, Emily, why don't you take it down temporarily? And if anybody in the administration wants us to throw it back up, we can easily do that. But I think it's just easier to see David. Yeah, great, perfect. Um, I think we may have um, sort of respective comments to add from our individual perspectives. Uh, but again, I, I just uh, certainly on behalf of the library, I want to uh, continue to um, articulate support for this, the creation of this commission and um, certainly willing to participate. And uh, it's exciting to see this uh, move forward, uh, particularly given the uh, breadth and diversity of uh, scope that is is envisioned. Um, there are two areas of the red line document that um, I, I would like um, to suggest we we should uh, take a quick look at or possibly even revise, uh, if not clarify. Uh, and I think the first one will probably be a little difficult to do, um, and that relates to section 715.1 purpose. Um, so Emily, as I understand, you, Emily, can you throw that up? I think since David's talking about yeah. it, it's probably it's easier for people to see it. There it is. You're already there. Great. So uh, clearly, we're trying to take. I believe propose that the commission takes its departure from these two major um, events that are are formally recognized. Uh, but what is what is very important is uh, to not limited to, to those two, two events. Um, however, uh, one of my concerns is that the current language opens it up to be um, possibly too broad, uh, depending on what the process would be for the commission to evaluate which uh, new historical events formally belong within this this scope and the the intent of diversification and recognizing those parts of history that perhaps have not gotten all the attention that they need to um, so this is this is more of a comment than a than a proposed language change or uh, at least request for for uh, for clarification um, and David I wonder mr. chairman do you mind if I just say a quick word on that Yes, you have the floor, Kenzie. Go ahead, no problem. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I hear you on it's sort of how do we, we really want it to be clear that, you know, there might be some other things that this commission is going to want to focus event and et cetera, planning on. And we didn't want to, we didn't want to prejudge that it was just the Sester Centennial and the 400th. Um, but I hear you on like it can't, it can't become literally every date in the history of the city. Um, I, I wonder if, potentially one way of dealing with that could be to be a little more specific about the fact that the timeline subcommittee is going to like figure that out and make a recommendation to the mayor about it. That's just a thought of mine, but I think we can put a, we can put a pin in that and think about it over the next few days. Right. I mean, it, it may be involved using words like primary or significant in a way that um, gives the commission the ability to be more inclusive, but without uh, feeling under pressure to uh, go too far uh, for whatever definition of too far might, might be. Um, the second and my only other comment relates to the first two of the three subcommittees. Um, so if we want to scroll down to, Emily, 
um, the more descriptive. Uh, yep, there we go. Uh, so uh, from our point of view, we see a substantial overlap between the work and scope of events and trails as defined with timeline and exhibits. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if some of that relates to the use of the word exhibits, um, which in our case, uh, you know, we, we think of exhibitions, exhibits and events as all being part of one um, one initiative. Uh, so, again, not a specific recommendation for language change, uh, but concern um, that we may have separated some things more than they need to be separated from a, um, from a working group point of view. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I almost wonder um, I like like I almost I mean it seems to me like we know that we know that the um, the timelines piece, there's kind of a deliberate goal there, right? That's laid out in the legislation of like it's a little bit what we were just talking about. Um, and and like actually kind of say like oh here are some key occasions that we should be focused on um and so i wonder if maybe almost we should be thinking about timelines and curricula and pushing exhibits into the first one or something you know what i mean and just acknowledging that it's going to be a big overlapping i, I don't know I, that's this is just a first sort of gut reaction i think yeah, I, th I think you, your reaction captures exactly the concern that we were we were spotting. It's just based upon how it's written. Again, there's there's no um, there's no criticism or lack of support for the intent here. It's just really about clarifying the scope of each working group so that they know what they're what they're focused on. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay, let's let's also. Um, maybe put a little bit of a pin in that, but we could circle back with you, David, and, and think about, I mean, I guess the tricky bit, I think the thing, the thing that got us there was the idea that we have a bunch of like archival and local history experts, mm -hmm. and that the kind of conversations about sort of like the content conversations about timelines, exhibits, and curricula kind of belong together. And there's almost more of an operational organizational conversation that characterizes events trails. And in some ways, the, the execution of exhibits, right? Which is like a little bit like, I think, right, you, you probably have some distinction even within the library between who's working with the documents and who's figuring out how it's all gonna be laid out in an exhibit and where, and like who's gonna come and what dates and all that jazz, right? So, um, so I think that was sort of part, part of what we were trying to do was not have um, operations people sitting in a room with archivists when it didn't make sense for either side. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but it almost seems like one of the questions being asked here is, what do we have or what do we think we should have that's missing? And then the other question is, what do we do about it, and what do we, how do we celebrate it and raise it up? So um, again, no, no, no question about um, the right intent, but but how best to describe and group um, these activities together? Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good way of describing the distinction. All right, so let's think a little bit more about that. But thank you. Um, but I appreciate the flag, and I, and I get from the library's perspective, exhibits often sort of are your events, as it were. Uh, and even even some definitions might might help just make sure there's no confusion later on also. Um, but I defer to my colleagues on additional uh, comments or feedback. Colleagues? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, David said something at the end there that I think is um, along the lines of what my kind of, I think it's it's a, a little bit of a framing question. Like I think the idea of having a couple of key questions that are the beginning of what the, the commission needs to address might be like kind of a pre-step before there's operationalizing the answer to that. And I think part of it is, um, and this is a conversation we've been having in the arts office a lot, is how does, how does, how does this become a living process, right? So if we're naming um, what some of the systemic barriers are, like why is it that what we have represented is not actually 
um, equitable and doesn't represent all the histories and communities that are here, then it's, I think it's kind of like, what can we pilot or learn or try around these events, these specific commemoration opportunities that can then help us make different recommendations about how, how this is going forward. But the kind of living piece of that is like, what does community engagement look like in general <laughs> going forward? Like there's definitely, a, I think, a certain amount of work that can happen getting archivists and experts together and saying like, if we were going to add 50 things to our calendar for the year, what would those 50 things be? But there's still the bigger, um, I think, question and value that we have around um, people being able to lift up their histories and stories as those continue in real time, right? Whether that's like through oral history or kind of like everyday lived experience or whatever that might be. So I think uh, that's that's the much mushier kind of part of this, but I think there's a way to set up both of those conversations through this work, because in order to to talk about that one comprehensively, we do need something like this that brings all these different commissions and departments to the table. Um, but I, I wonder if that's something that we can set up with some framing and some key questions. And I do think the what do we do now and a little bit of that survey of who's doing what and what exists where, what's being commemorated is a helpful starting place. Like to so speaking from the public art side of things, we uh, only this year will have a full searchable database of the city's public art collection, including like who's represented, you know, the demographics of who created the art, what's in the art. Um, and even though we have a lot of assumptions that are correct about what's missing and what's overrepresented, like having that evidence-based approach is also really helpful um, and helps us think about, okay, if we're going to do public engagement coming out of that to help source like what's missing, um, we can be then really focused about what that looks like. So I think it's kind of, for me, also balancing that expertise with, with broader engagement and like what does a living process look like? Yeah, no, that makes sense, Cara. And I think, I mean, I think to some extent I'm hesitant. I don't want to, I don't want to over encode like key questions and, and community engagement and processes and whatever into legislation, because I want like the commission to be able to, to do that in a dynamic, good way. Um, but, uh, but I do think maybe we need to think a little bit about how do we get the language to convey, like certainly one of my hopes with this is just as with, with the built environment, I think we need different tools that enable us to preserve community history buildings like all over the city. And for you know somebody who lives in a, in a neighborhood of the city with less development and less money that's been going into the historic resources to have a shot at, you know, at sort of marshalling those, I think that's really important, right? Um, similarly, like, you know, my hope would be not just that for these anniversaries, we end up with some new B BPS curricular modules related to local history, but that we actually end up with a process for BPS to kind of say, oh, every year we've got a new local history module that's like coming online, right? So that we know that our, our young people are going to learn the history of Boston um, in an exciting, uh, interesting, diverse, inclusive way, right? Um, or, or like with the archives, right, that, I mean, we are losing so much archival material from the 20th century right now because it molders away in basements and it's not precious enough to have been scanned yet, but not digital, right? And like one of the things we hear all the time from community archivists is like, there's just no support for preserving this stuff. And I mean, we're lucky if it gets to the city archives, um, but they also, you know, I think, so thinking about in the same way that um, that kind of curricular archival um, the basis for being able to do local exhibits and trails, like how do we bulk up our tools for that would be a thing that we would hope would come out of the system, like out of the commission, it would be lasting past the sunsetting of the commission, right? Like we can't, we we want there to be like a real change there. That's not just like, oh, well, didn't we have a great decade of history, and like, you know, work in the city and now we're, we're over that again, you know? Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. And I think that's, I think maybe then it's like baking in some of these questions. So at least they're kind of attached to the commission and give us like a little bit of a direction. And, and I do think it's a useful exercise to name some of the, the barriers that we do know, even though they might seem really obvious. Like I think that something that we've run into is um, how much cultural preservation that's not tied to buildings and structures right? Like if we're trying to create space for rituals or traditions or memories or other things, like they don't necessarily have a 
kind of commission structure that goes with them. A lot of our commissions are about objects and and buildings, right? And so there's some stuff like that that I think if we if we name it, even though that's kind of a simple starting point, it helps us think about what we could be doing differently. But really excited for for the opportunity for all of these to come together, um, and to also think long term. This is <laughs> we don't usually get a chance to do that, right? Yeah, but it'll be here before we know it. <laughs> Kate did, or John? I, I don't want to take up too much time. I, I just would, we're totally supportive of this. Every, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that we're starting this now. Um, and our office sometimes gets pushed in at the, the very last minute with promotion and <laughs> all sorts of stuff. So I'm really excited to be a part of this from the beginning. And anything we can do to help facilitate, we're, we're here. So. Did we have anything from, um, I know we've got, I see John, you're on. Did you have anything from the archives? Yes. Um, there's um, a couple of points of reference that I'd, I'd like to make for the, for the uh, committee's consideration. Uh, and they, they may help to uh, directly address the, the local communities uh, you know, in, in terms of um, of attracting their involvement. Um, first, uh, could the ordinance, ordinance specifically refer to the value of history to Boston's communities? And the second, uh, could the ordinance specifically mention research initiatives that will unearth and develop those histories from archival resources, which are, of course, to be found all over the city, ranging from historical societies, the university archives, to the public sector institutions. So first, should this ordinance include language by which the city acknowledges and acclaims the practical value of community history, the, the practical value community history holds for communities themselves? Could the ordinance spell out that Community history fosters a link with the past that offers people meaning, purpose, and value. That it serves the sustainability of communities, empowering people to, to participate in local democracy and active citizenship. That it, can cons that it can significantly contribute to the community's intellectual, social, and economic well-being. That it can foster deeper mutual understanding among people from a diverse range of cultural backgrounds, such as we have in Boston, can it uh, that it can uh, play a significant role in building uh, shared culture and trust among Boston's large and extraordinarily diverse population sectors? And second, given the premise of history's social pragmatism. Should the ordinance adopt as a key objective the development of community initiatives across the city to unearth the history of Boston's peoples? Should the ordinance and the commission specifically encourage the use of historical records and primary sources to support programs actively explore, exploring Boston's histories through original research, exhibitions, and public discussion? So, with the upcoming commemorations focusing our attention on history, might it be inferred in the ordinance that there is opportunity in the work of the commission for the people of Boston to deepen their understanding of what history is, of what their own history is, and of how an understanding of history can lead to the betterment of society. Well, John, I'm really glad we have those remarks on tape because um, I think I think you're I think you're absolutely right that um, as as historians we know that often it's only when we actually write things down that people in the future know what we were trying to get at, right? So mm -hmm. I think uh, the idea the idea of maybe trying to have some more um, some more fulsome framing that really stresses the civic purpose of this and the way that history. Uh, is so is so important to the people of our city, um, and and specifically that kind of archival research thing. I think 
I think a lot of those things that you just said, I mean, to me, it would make good sense to put them in, put them in the document. And I don't think it would uh, kill too many more trees for us to have some of that framing up, up top. That's, that's my gut reaction to that. Great, thank you. Um, well, th thank you, thank you for those remarks. I think they're really helpful. Um, and I strongly co-sign them. Um, uh, Michael, was there anything from the BPDA side? Um, no, I just want to add that we've been working with uh, Roseanne and her team on revising the Article 85, you know, the demolition delays. So I know that's underway. So at some point, folks like Brian Glasscock, who's been part of that whole discussion, might be uh, important as the third subcommittee gets more underway on, on, um, on <clears throat> sort of enhancing our preservation activities throughout the, the city. So I think um, you know, we're willing to work and help as much as we can, and especially whether it's revising uh, the zoning to adopt uh, a stronger um, demolition delay ordinance or other pieces of that. So um, no, I think we're excited to be part of, of this uh, committee. So, and I apologize, I'm, I'm working from home. I've had some health issues the last week. So, I'm not in the office, so that's why I'm kind of cut the camera off. No worries at all. And thank you. Thank you for being here with us. And yeah, thank you. I mean, I think we're all excited that the, some work is underway on the Article 85 front. Um, and and I think hoping that we can we can think about what a more robust Article 85 works better for everyone looks like in combination, right, with a whole bunch of resources and tools for, for effective and equitable historic preservation. So I think bringing, this is why we're so glad the BPDA is included in the mix here. So thanks for being here today and for coming consistently throughout these sessions. I just want to add that the demolition delay ordinance in some way is the stick. And I think hopefully through this committee, we could figure out more carrots to, I know that's what Roseanne's always been talking about. How do we encourage people to preserve their buildings rather than sort of saying that you have to go through a demolition delay ordinance, that it really should be the first part of any discussion is how can you preserve the building? So that's what I'm, my goal would be is how we can develop more carrots and less sticks. Absolutely, totally agree. And making it possible for people, right? Like look, making, making adaptive reuse opportunities clear, helping people know things up front so that they can plan from the beginning with a kind of you know goal around the use of the building tied up with um, historic preservation opportunities and and yeah and, and trying to marshal resources for those carrots. So yeah, strongly agree, Michael. Thank you. Um, Reverend White Hammond. No, I'm just listening. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I think it's exciting. I think folks have leaned into some of the technical details. Um, we obviously support it. I mean, I think I've shared with you, we, we um, are interested in sort of understanding who's going to bottom line and some of those uh, those those questions of like how we, we move uh, some of these things forward. But I think that is not, that's not an ordinance level uh, conversation. That's but looking forward to uh, um collaborating with all the folks on here who we love and it'll be good to have to work on something together. Yes, no, fair. Absolutely. I think, yeah, not in the ordinance, but definitely on the execution side, who's who's sort of like owning various things is going to be important. We all know that. Um, but we won't try to write it into the law. Um, so, uh, and, and Roseanne, I saw you put your camera on. Um, did you have some comments from the Landmarks Commission? Yeah, I just wanted to you know, be the broken record again, bringing up archaeology as part of um, preservation uh, in Boston. And I'm not sure, you know, how or where to fit that, but it would be good to to have it in a place of prominence because that will, that will impact uh, on how we interpret indigenous culture, right? So. 
Thank you. No, that's a really important. We that was a note we had from the last session, and I know that we made a note, and I guess we missed adding it in here. Um, so, I mean, I think at a minimum, we definitely want, uh, you know, the city's archaeology department represented at the table on the commission. But I also think that to your point, there's, I think, so it's both, it's both probably putting them in the commission itself. And then also, as we describe the sort of scope and, and in these subcommittees mentioning the archaeological dimension, I think you're totally right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we neglected to get that in after the last time. Well, there's still you. time, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, as, no, I know, and he came, Joe, came, Joe came and everything last time, so I'm I'm embarrassed that that not, that's not a, it to the red line. So not a worry. Um, and and Lynn, did you have anything? Hi there, folks. There we go. <laughs> um, all I can say is I'm, I'm assuming that the best fit for me will be the uh, Preservation Tools Committee. And I, when can we start <laughs> is all I want to know. <laughs> so thanks for including me. And um, I mean, there's, there's, a, I feel a great deal of urgency here, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's so much we need to do. <laughs> so um, Strongly I agree. look forward to getting started. Yes. No, and that's why we're that's why we're really trying to get this passed before the end of session yes. in a couple of weeks. So so that we can get off to the races and actually do the work. Um, and yeah, thank you for all that you do as the chair of the Landmarks Commission. Really appreciate it. And all that you're willing to do in joining us in this effort. So um so I I think, Mr. Chairman, I've run through all of the um all of the administration officials on the call with us, unless anybody had something they neglected to say. Um, and certainly our next steps would be to share with your office. Um, you know, we, we take all, we've been taking notes on all these comments and to try to try to do some, you know, red line, additional red line edits, um, that reflect people's, uh, suggestions today and then circulate them to you, Mr. Chairman and, uh, and the chair, um, of the committee's office and then to, uh, and then to the administration and try to like get land somewhere. Does that does that make sense to you? Yeah, that, that does. And just while we have a second, Michelle Goldberg is on. Obviously, she's the uh, the the uh, committee liaison. Michelle, is there any outstanding issues that you need uh, addressed? Given that you're going to be um, uh, sort of doing some of the final, putting the final touches on the drafts and the red line. So, is there anything that um, you need to ask either uh, through the chair or through uh, Kenzie of the administration or any of our guests? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we're in a good place um, and looking forward to following up with the sponsor um, and uh, yourself. Very good. And, and then I know, Mr. Chair, that we have a couple of folks um, who uh, were joining us today to testify. Um, sure. a, few, a few on the list, and I see at least two of them here right now. Um, Jean-Luc is here from the um, from NICOB, and Allison Frazee is here from the Boston Preservation Alliance. So I wondered if if um, you can yes, now be an appropriate time for them to weigh in. Sure. Now is the perfect time if they can just introduce their name and any affiliation they have, and then they uh, can take the floor. And Kerry, could you would please admit and allow them to have um, audio? I see Allison. And now I see Jean-Luc. Mr. Chairman, is it okay if Allison goes ahead? Yes, good afternoon, Allison. Welcome to the council hearing and you have the floor. Please introduce uh, yourself, name and affiliation, if any, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to be here and part of this conversation as always. I'm Allison Frazee. I'm assistant director of the Boston Preservation Alliance. We're a local nonprofit that advocates for historic preservation. Um, and we're excited to, to be a part of this moving forward. Um, we don't, I don't have any specific suggestions for the language, but I did have a thought um, as everyone was talking today. I, I think we can all agree that we have not excelled um, at telling the whole history of Boston, representing all the different stories of all the different people um, throughout our history. And I think it's worth taking some time to reflect on why we've, we've not excelled at doing that, why our tools don't reflect that, 
um, and, and making sure that we don't make the same mistakes again that we've made in the past. So I, I think we're making strides to do that by making sure that there's wider representation on these subcommittees. But what else can we do to make sure that we're being inclusive and thoughtful? What have, you know, what have we not done right in the past that we can correct this time? Um, I think we were, we're all probably doing that in our own offices, um, but it, it might be worth a, a broader conversation just to make sure we're getting it right. Uh, so thank you all for your time on this and we look forward to um, continued engagement. Thank you, Allison. And uh, who's up next? Uh, Jean-Luc, I think. Jean-Luc. Jean-Luc, welcome. Uh, state your name and affiliation. For the record, you have the floor, Jean-Luc. Thank you for joining. Hi, my name is uh, Jean-Luc Carit, and I am a resident of Jamaica Plain and uh, president of the North American Indian Center of Boston. So just a, just a quick note for, for the language there. We're not the Native American Indian Center of Boston. We're the North American Indian Center of Boston. Uh, but I, I, I definitely I definitely appreciate the um, uh, the updates. Uh, of course, uh, for for Indigenous nations, we are not just a, a monolithic eth ethnic group. Uh, rather, we are uh, individual nations with uh, with different um, relationships with Massachusetts and and Boston. Uh, of course, North American Indian Center of Boston, we are the liaison for the Commonwealth and uh, residents who are members of tribes that are outside of the current borders. So thinking about Penobscot, uh, the Mi'kmaq, of course, we call ourselves the North American Indian Center of Boston because we uh, we provide services for American Indians and First Nations that, that come here from Canada uh, to live and work. Uh, and there is definitely a complex history there. I just wanted to kind of follow up on some of the uh, the comments earlier. Of course, and then uh, the previous comment as well, uh, definitely about the tools. I think it's it's not just about sort of like refining the tools, uh, but it's also improving access to the tools. Of course, we have a lot of capacity issues when we come to uh, community archives and community serving uh, organizations. Uh, so what we definitely uh, what we definitely need uh, is access uh, for tools, partnerships between. Uh, institutions um, and community members uh, so that we can make sure that we have a full, you know, all hands on board uh, telling of, of the of this very complex history. So that that's all I had to add. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Uh, anyone else wishing to offer public testimony? Um, Carrie, anyone in the waiting room that uh, I cannot see? Shall I don't no think we have anyone in the waiting room right now. Shall no one else has signed up or has contacted you via email or anything like that looking to offer public testimony? Uh, we did have a couple additional people um, that I know were interested. Um, I don't see them in the waiting room right now, though. Okay. And uh, they obviously, if they contact you either by uh, phone or email, just let them know that they could submit uh, their testimony uh, to the committee as well if we miss them. So uh, at this point, unless um, I see any additional um, requests for public testimony, that will close the public testimony portion. And I'll turn it back over to uh, the lead sponsor, Kinsley Bach, to, uh, to close out. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, um, and, and to both Allison and Jean-Luc for testifying. And Jean-Luc, we have already corrected it to North American. My apologies. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for weighing in today. Uh, like I said, my office will take on um, the work of, of doing some additional red lines based on the comments today um, and, you know, and really try to capture, I think, uh, I think there were a number of, of comments that sort of wove together that question of making sure that the commission starts out on an intentional foot, um, not only in literally who's in the room, but in kind of like how it's approaching this work. Um, and, and thinking about getting everybody's voices into the mix. So, um, so yeah, we uh, will send stuff around. I guess I would just ask um, the administration members whose email boxes we will be pinging to look at the red lines when we send them, uh, because uh, you know certainly um, you know my objective uh, with the partnership of uh, the chairman today and uh, and the chair of the committee. Um, of GovOps, Councillor Edwards, um, would be to, to try to land somewhere um, so that we were in a position to pursue passage by uh, by the 15th um, of December. So 
so yeah, so just um, look for uh, incoming to an inbox near you. Um, Good. So that will conclude uh, the 3 p.m. working session on docket uh, 0638. Um, and the uh, matter obviously is uh, an ordinance to create um, the Boston uh, Commemoration Commission. And uh, at this time, the uh, chair of government officer through via the vice chair will um, adjourn the hearing. Thank you everyone for your time and attention and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The working session is adjourned. <laughs>